Today we are going to, uh, actually probably next Sunday, uh, we'll wrap up our study of the Trinity. And uh, the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at, um, you could call it, how the Trinity functions. This has been really the part of uh, this study that I've been really excited to share, and uh, I hope it will be helpful and enlightening to you. Um, much of this, <laughs> Bruce Ware uses this this uh phrase, reading the Bible with Trinitarian lenses. And uh, I, my, my hope is um, that by the time we're done with this, you'll start to do that. You'll start to just see the Trinity all over the Bible. Uh, it, it really opens things up. Um, we're going to be looking at <clears throat> essentially the last part of uh, our statement of faith on the Trinity specifically, uh, which says, each Trinitarian person has always existed and is fully God. Equal in essence, yet distinct persons executing harmonious roles. Uh, that last part there about how the distinct persons of the Trinity exercise harmonious roles. Um, that's what we're going to be focusing on. Uh, we've seen the last several weeks from Scripture that the Father, the Son, the Spirit are all God. Uh, they share the same divine essence, uh, yet they are distinguished from one another. And today, um, like I said, we'll focus on uh, the roles and relationships that the Father, Son, and Spirit have with one another. And this brings up many important concepts, not the least of which is uh, the eternal subordination of the Son. And this is what we're, where we're going to start today. Um, it's a controversial subject, and it's one of those I don't understand why it's controversial. Um, because as we'll see, it's just all over the Bible. And uh, I don't know how you get away from it. But... Um, let me just explain kind of before we go to Scripture what this position is saying. Essentially, the eternal subordination of the Son, sometimes called uh, eternal functional subordination, um, it's basically the idea that the Bible teaches the Son always was, is, and will be under the authority of the Father, uh, hence the names Son and Father. So as we saw last week, Son and Father doesn't... <clears throat> doesn't mean that the Father gave birth to the Son. Obviously, no. Jesus has always existed. Uh, he's equal with the Father. He didn't come from the Father. Okay, there, uh, there wasn't a time when Jesus didn't exist. And so if, if we say he was uh, born of the Father, then that would mean he didn't exist and then he came into existence. Um, so that's, we want to avoid that. So then what does Father and Son mean? That becomes the question. If it doesn't mean the way we think of a father giving birth to a son, what does it mean? Uh, and as we talked about last week, as Catherine so eloquently uh, explained, uh, it, it means, at least I believe it means, it, um, the relationship of authority and submission. And so even within the triune God, uh, the Father has authority over the Son and Spirit. So we're going to look at that uh, today. We will focus probably primarily on the Son, uh, there are many texts we can go to about the Spirit, that the Spirit is under the authority of the Son and the Father. Uh, and we'll see that some, but for the most part, uh, we'll be looking at the relationship of the Son to the Father. Um, and before we dive into that, let me just say, this is please don't take this as inferiority. Okay, Just because the Son submits to the Father, that doesn't mean he is less God. Uh, that doesn't mean that he is somehow uh, not equal with the Father. He absolutely is. However, there is still a relationship, um, roles of authority and submission within the Trinity. All right, we begin by looking at the submission of the Son in the incarnate state. And this is really uh, what everybody agrees with, right? That when Jesus was on earth, at least, as a human, he was fully in submission to his heavenly Father. Uh, first, John 7, 16, we'll see that Jesus taught everything that he taught was what the Father directed him to teach. John 7, verse 16. Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Seems pretty straightforward. If anyone's will is to do God's will, and by the way, again, God, we mentioned this before, normally in the New Testament when you see God, it is shorthand for the Father. Uh, we'll see that quite a bit as we go today. If anyone's uh, will is to do God's will, he will know whether... The teaching is from God, or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. 
Okay, so Jesus is saying there, I am not teaching from my own wisdom, from my own authority. Uh, I am teaching what the Father has given me. And he does this in order that he would bring glory to his Father. And so his, his whole goal on earth in teaching what the Father has given him to teach is to glorify his heavenly Father. Uh, the way in which God the Father gave Jesus these words, you might be thinking, uh, what was he whispering in his ear? Uh, did he give these to him in heaven? And then Jesus came and taught. Uh, we don't have to wonder about that. Jesus tells us, John 3, verse 34. For he whom God sent, Jesus, utters the words of God, the Father. For he, and the he there would be the Father, gives the Spirit without measure. This is an important concept we'll see in a few other places, that Jesus is the one person in human history that was directed fully, without measure, by the Holy Spirit. Everything he did, everything he said, was under the authority of the Father, and it was guided uh, through the Spirit. And so the Father anointed Jesus with the Spirit without measure, such that everything Jesus said, everything Jesus did, was what the Spirit led him do, to do under the direction of the Father. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. This is exactly what Moses prophesied of the coming Christ. Uh, he said, I will raise up, this is God speaking to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you uh, from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Uh, and so we see the fulfillment of that in Jesus. John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus again speaking. I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So and there's many other texts we could look at, um, it, but I think it's pretty clear. Jesus, his teaching was not something he came up with. He spoke as he was directed to by the Father through the Spirit. Uh, John 5, verse 17, not only Jesus teachings, but also Jesus' actions. Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. And just a side note there, the Jews, you notice, understood when Jesus said, uh, I am the Son of God. They did not see that as inferiority. They understood that if someone claimed to be the Son of God, and that means he shares the same essence as God and therefore is equal with the Father. You see that even in that text. Um, John 5, the next verse, uh, 19. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. So not only did Jesus' teaching come from the Father, but everything that Jesus did was in perfect obedience to his Father. John 8, verse 28, Jesus said to them, uh, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is in me, he has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Uh, Peter said this in Acts chapter 10. Listen closely here to the distinctions made between the Father and the Son, and you'll see very clearly in these verses the relationship of submission and authority within uh, the Trinity, between the, the Son and Father. Acts 10, starting verse 36, As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism uh, that John proclaimed, John the Baptist, how God... Okay, and God there would be, pop quiz, Father. The Father anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good. Who's the he there? Jesus. Jesus went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed by the devil for God, which would be the Father, was with him, Jesus. And we all are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him, Jesus, on a tree. But God, the Father, raised him, Jesus, on the third day and made him, Jesus, to appear. Not to all people, but to us who had been chosen by 
God, the Father, as witnesses. So you see there, the Father, you know, first back in 38, anoints you with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus does everything that the Father, Father's will was on earth. Then the Father is the one who raises Christ from the dead the third day. And he made him to appear to specific people that he had chosen. So Jesus didn't just go around showing himself to whoever he wanted. He went and appeared to those that the Father had chosen for him to appear to. Uh, as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, verse 42. And he, Jesus, commanded us, the disciples are speaking here, to preach to the people, to testify that he, Jesus, is the one appointed by God, the Father, to be judge of the living and the dead. So even in Christ's judgment over the earth, that is a role that is under the authority of the Father. The Father gave Jesus. Uh, he was appointed by the Father. Jesus was appointed by the Father to be the judge of the living and the dead. So, all that to say, everything Jesus did while on earth was in perfect obedience to his heavenly Father. And again, pretty much everyone agrees on this point. This is not very debatable. Um, the debatable word, by the way, in the eternal subordination of the Son is the word eternal. Okay, most theologians, pretty much all theologians would agree, yes, Jesus submitted to the Father while on earth. But where it gets more um, controversial is when you say that that authority of submission, and uh, I'm sorry, that, that relationship of authority and submission extends all the way in the past and all the way in the future, and is still a present reality too. In other words, Jesus wasn't just submissive to the Father while he was a human. He's always been in submission to his Father, and he always will be. And so that's what we'll see next, the submission of the Son in eternity past. Um, look at a few texts on this, and basically what we're going to try to prove is that the relationship of submission that Jesus had to his Father did not start when he came to earth. It was already in place all the way in eternity past. John 8, verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God the Father, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Okay, so there you see, uh, prior to Christ coming to earth, God the Father is the one who sent him. What does that mean? <laughs> it means he had authority over Jesus. He had the authority to send him. Um, this is not like the, you know, the three persons of the Trinity had a meeting and they just voluntarily decided, okay, yes, I'm going to go. No, the Father sent the Son. He commanded the Son to come to earth. It was not a, a mutual decision. Jesus says there, I didn't come of my own accord. But he was submitting to the authority of his Father and coming to earth and becoming human. This is affirmed in many other places. John 3.17, for example, God did not send his Son, the Father, did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. So again, you see the Father is the one who sent the Son into the world. Uh, they did not discuss this issue. They did not come to a mutual decision. The Father had authority to send the Son prior to the Incarnation. Galatians 4, verse 4, Paul speaking. But when the fullness of time had come, God, which would be the Father, sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God, Father, has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So there you see, not only, verse 4, God sent forth His Son to be born, but then in verse 6, God sent His Spirit into our hearts. And so you see the Father having authority over the Son and over the Spirit. The reason I keep asking you to... to uh, audibly say the who it is, is because for a lot of us, when we read through the New Testament, uh, we just kind of think generic God. <laughs> when we see those pronouns, he did this. We don't ask, well, which person is being spoken of? And many times in the context, it's, it's clear if you think about it, uh, who it is that's actually being referred to. And again, God in the New Testament, almost without exception, is talking about the Father. Uh, okay, so God there has authority over the Son. He sends him into the world. He has authority over the Spirit. Uh, the Father does, and so he sends him into our hearts. Uh, let's see here. Um, notice, it, it, in e each of these texts, um, one person is sending the other, and it's always the Father. 
The Father is always the one sending. The Son never sends the Father. Uh, the Son never commands the or the Spirit never commands the Son. It's always the Father directing, uh, commanding, sending the Spirit, the Son. First John four verse fourteen. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. And so the Father sent His Son. Uh, the Father did not beget His Son there, but rather He sent His Son. In those terms. Father and Son are using uh, human language to explain the relationship of authority and submission within God. Okay, so again, it's not that the Father gave birth to the Son sometime in the past. No. The Father is like a human father. He has authority over his Son. That's what's being communicated there. Romans 8, verse 29, For those whom he foreknew, uh, this would be the Father, those whom he, the Father, foreknew, we'll see that later, uh, in, the, in this verse, he, the Father, also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he, the Son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so you see there, <clears throat> God the Father, in eternity past, predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. The election of salvation, uh, the election of some to salvation, is an act of the Father. It's not an act of the Spirit or the Son. And this is consistent in Scripture. And again, most of us, when we think of uh, God doing something, we just kind of think, well, it's all three, you know, working together, and they're all doing it. Uh, no. <laughs> they have, I mean, in some cases, sure, you can see in creation, for instance, all three are involved. But even in creation, you see the Father creates the world through His Spirit. The Father uh, creates by the Son. And so you still see this, these roles of one is in authority. You could say one is like the architect uh, the planner of the thing. The other, Jesus, would be uh, the agent of creation, and the Spirit empowers it. And so you still see these, these distinct roles uh, that are never violated in Scripture. And so it is the Father who draws men to salvation through Jesus Christ, and then he seals them with his Spirit. Ephesians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he, the Father, chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he, the Father, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his, the Father's, will. Uh, I bring these texts up not to show, you know, to start a discussion about Calvinism, uh, but rather to show that. Paul uses specific language here. The Father is the one who chose us, and he chose to adopt us to himself through his Son, Jesus. So we should not think of the Trinity as a council of three persons equal in authority. No. The Father has authority over the Son and over the Spirit. And these texts are demonstrating that this authority of the Father has always been the case. Notice in these verses it says, before the foundations of the world this happened. So this is not talking about Christ being in submission in the incarnate state. This is, uh, even in eternity past, this was always the case. So before the foundation of the world, the Father planned, predestined to save us through Jesus Christ. The roles of authority and submission existed even back then. These texts do not say that God chose this, that God planned this, but that the Father did, specifically. John 17, verse 24 Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me, notice that, whom you, the Father, have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory uh, that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Again, notice the Father gives glory to the Son before the foundation of the world. Uh, the Father chooses us in Christ to give us uh, as a bride for the groom, right? That's the analogy in all throughout Scripture, that we are the bride of Christ. And the Father has chosen us to be in this relationship with His Son. And so even in that, you see the authority of the Father is over that of the Son. Uh, if Jesus wanted us to think of the three persons as equal in authority and position, He could have referred to Him as His brother. But instead, He refers to Him as His Father to show us the role of authority that belongs to the Father and that the Son willingly submits to Him. One more text on this before we move to the next point. Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God, who's that? 
the Father, spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he, the Father, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he, the Father, appointed the heir of all things. So God the Father appointed Christ the heir of all things, and that's talking about uh, you know, the kingdom eventually overtaking the world, how the nations have been given to Christ. We'll see some of that later. Uh, so God has appointed Christ as the heir of all things, through whom also he, the Father, created the world. So there you see God the Father creates the world through Jesus Christ. That's why in John 1, for instance, it doesn't just, it doesn't just say um, Jesus made everything. It says all things were made by him, yes, but even in that you see God the Father is the one who makes, who creates by the Son. Uh, you never see those roles uh, disappearing even in acts like creation. This leads uh, nicely into our next section because you see here you have Jesus in eternity past in verse 2. He was in submission to the Father uh, even back in creation. He was under the Father. Uh, and then verse 3, you'll see after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, after the ascension, Jesus is still in submission to the authority of his Father. It says there, he, Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God, the Father, the exact imprint of his nature, speaking of the Father. And he upholds the universe by the, by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he, this would be Jesus, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so there you see Jesus Christ seated at the Father's right hand, uh, which means even in that you can see one is on the throne, one is at the right hand of the throne. You see this, this role. They're not um, equal. In, they're equal in essence, yes. That's why it says there, he has the exact imprint of his nature. Okay, Equally God. Homo usias, as we've said. Yeah, same essence. And yet, one's on the throne, one's on the right hand of the Father. Clearly you see this uh, authority and submission that continues even into the future. And so now we move to that uh, next section, which would be the submission of the Son in eternity future. So just to recap, Jesus was in submission while on earth. That's clear. Many texts. I, I only do what my Father leads me to. I only speak the things my Father tells me to. Um, in the past, God creates the world through the Son. Uh, God the Father sends the Son. And so you see authority and submission even before Jesus was a human. Now we're going to see even into the future. Presently, Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And even in the future, in the future kingdom of Christ, he is still under the submission of his heavenly Father. Romans 8, verse 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God, at the right hand of the Father, who indeed is interceding for us. And so there you see Christ at the right hand of the Father, and he's making intercession on behalf of believers. Hebrews 7, verse 25, a similar uh, statement. Consequently, he, Christ, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God, Father, through him, Christ, since he, Christ, always lives to make intercession for them. And so you've got the Father interceding on behalf of us to the Father. Okay, I'm sorry, did I say the Father twice there? Jesus, sorry, interceding for us to his Father. Even in that, don't you see a relationship of authority and submission, where the Son is under the Father, and he is interceding to God the Father on our behalf. Um, it, it would be sort of like, uh, well, I don't want to use too many analogies here. I get in trouble with those. Uh, but if somebody was in a, a deputy or something of a president, and, and you asked him to intercede on your behalf, even in that, you see the relationship of one is above the role of the other. Uh, Acts 2, verse 32, this Jesus God raised up. Again, God almost always, shorthand for the Father. This Jesus, God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, at the right hand of the Father, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He, Christ, has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Again, we're not focusing much on the Spirit there, uh, but you can see in that verse... And this is Peter, let me just give the context, Peter speaking on the day of Pentecost, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit has descended upon them, they're speaking in unknown languages, all this crazy stuff is happening. And uh, he says here that this is because Jesus, after his resurrection, went to be seated at the right hand of the Father. He received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, 
and he poured out the Spirit on us. Okay, and you see several things there. First of all, fathers over son, right? He received this from God the Father. And then you see son over spirit, because the son is the one who sends the spirit to us. And so you see these clear roles and relationships of authority and submission within the Trinity. Uh, Revelation 1 verse 1, this one uh, I just recently noticed, and I had never, I had always glossed over these words um, in Revelation 1. The revelation, this is the very first verse that John gives us in his uh, letter here. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So the revelation of, of Christ, which was given to John, was first given to Jesus by God the Father. You see that there? Uh, there this is the revelation of Christ which God the Father gave him, the him there is Jesus, to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. And he, Jesus, made it known by sending his angel to John. And so even in, in the very first verse of Revelation, you see uh, the authority of uh, God the Father giving to the Son this revelation that then the Son gives to the Apostle John. Um, Ephesians 1, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ... That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And who would be the him there? This is not an easy one. But take a look. Try to figure this out. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Fa this is Paul praying for the Christians in, in Ephesus, that the God, he's praying that God the Father, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Who's him? Oh, I'm hearing different answers. Specifically, not just God. Which one? Jesus. Okay, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. So uh, God the Father reveals Christ through the spirit to his people. Uh, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, he being God the Father, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable power, uh, greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might. All of those hises there are the Father, and we know this because of verse 20. Uh, the working of his great might that he worked in Christ. And so you can see that those pronouns were all the Father because he goes on to say he did this in Christ, whom he, the Father, I'm uh, sorry, when he raised him, Jesus, from the dead and seated him. Notice that. The Father seated Christ at his right hand in the heavenly places. I mean, could you see the authority and submission any clearer there? That the Father has the authority. He raises Christ from the dead and then he says, sit here at my right hand. Uh, that is authority and submission within God. Verse 21, he seats him at, uh, at his right hand in heavenly places, far above uh, rule, all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he, the Father, put all things under his feet, all things under the feet of Christ, and gave him, gave Christ as head over all things to the church. And so you see there the authority of Jesus to reign over all the world was given to him, uh, by the Father. I don't have the verses here, but I believe it's Matthew uh, 28, right? When Jesus says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Well, who gave it? <laughs> who gave Christ authority over heaven and earth? The Father. And so in that, you see, the Father has the authority to give this position uh, to Jesus Christ. Revelation 2, verse 26 the one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. This is the Father speaking, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself, now this is Jesus, as I myself have received authority from my Father. And so he's quoting there from the Old Testament how uh, the prophets said that one would come that would rule with a rod of iron, obviously speaking of the Messiah in the eternal kingdom. And so um, Jesus Christ is given authority over the nations, and he, he has received that authority from his heavenly Father. Uh, Christ being at the right hand of the Father 
is not a position of equal authority. It is authority second only to the one on the throne. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. This is such an, a fascinating text uh, on the end times and the, even in eternity future. We see the relationship of authority and submission within the Trinity. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. So the key there clearly is Christ, right? Christ delivers the kingdom. He conquers the world through the gospel, and then he delivers that kingdom to God the Father. He's destroyed every rule, every opposing authority and power on earth, and he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. For he must reign, this is quoting from the Old Testament, he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For, and there you see a quotation, God has put all things in, uh, in subjection under his feet. Okay, who's God there? Father. The Father's put all things in subjection under Christ's feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, everything's under the authority of Christ, it is plain that he is accepted. Now notice accepted there with an E. Okay, he is excluded. The exception is he, and the he there, of course, is the Father. So, all things are put in subjection, but it is plain, it's obvious, Paul says, that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. You get that there? So, uh, there's one person in eternity future who will not be under the authority of the Son. The only one. And it's the one who put all things under subjection to him, which would be the Father. Okay, so the Father gives the kingdom to Christ. He gives him all authority. But Paul says, but it's obvious that, that he's accepted. The Father's not going to be under the authority of the Son. Uh, he's the one who gives all things to the Son's authority. Verse 28, when all things are subjected to him, the Son, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things, that would be the Father, in subjection under him, that God the Father may be all in all. I mean, this is pretty clear, right? That in eternity future, even in, in the eternal kingdom of Christ, when he's seated on the throne, ruling over everything, there's one exception. Even as Christ is ruling the world, he is doing so in perfect obedience and in perfect sub, uh, submission, subjection to God the Father. Jesus is king. We are to pray. Remember, Jesus told us to pray. Uh, Father, may your kingdom come. I thought it was the kingdom of Jesus. Uh, well, ultimately, it's the kingdom of God, the Father, through Jesus. Jesus is ruling um, as, uh, how would we say this? He's ruling on behalf of the Father. He's, he's ruling over everything. But even in his kingship over us, he is doing so in submission and obedience to God the Father. And so there's a sense in which you could say that the Father is the one ruling through Christ. Revelation 12, verse 10, this is why the angel there says, now, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. And so you see uh, the kingdom of Jesus is still, it's ultimately the kingdom of the Father ruled through Jesus Christ. Jesus is over us and the Father is over Jesus. Uh, we see this language throughout the New Testament that Christ is the head of the church. We understand that, of course, to mean that we, the church, are in submission to Christ, right? That's what the, I mean, what else could that mean? Christ is the head of the church, and God the Father is the head of Christ. 1 Corinthians eleven three. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. We're not going to get into the uh, submission and authority in marriage yet. We'll get there. Uh, but notice there that Christ is under the authority of God the Father. Ephesians 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And so uh, there you just see a definition of what Paul means by headship. When he says Christ is the head of the church, verse 23, he says the church submits to Christ. So that's obviously what he's talking about when he uses this language of a headship, that Christ is the authority over the church. And then in 1 Corinthians 11, he goes on to explain that Christ's head is God the Father. Uh, one final text here, Philippians 2, 
Verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God the Father a thing to be grasped. And so he was, he was equal with the Father, but he didn't hold on to that. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he, Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, who was he obedient to? God the Father. Verse 9, Therefore God the Father has highly exalted him, highly exalted Christ, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So God the Father raises him from the dead, exalts him to the throne, uh, commands everyone to worship, bow the knee to Christ, and every tongue confess, verse 11, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so all of that is done. Jesus was obedient to the point of death on the cross, and he does all of this in order to glorify his heavenly Father. Uh, so I hope that's pretty clear. I don't know how much more scripture you can have on this. That in eternity past, uh, in the, the incarnation, presently, and all the way in the future, the Son is under the authority of the Father. There is authority and submission within the Trinity. We're out of time for today. Next week, we're going to talk about um, implications of this. Uh, and I, I see some of you have questions. You'll ask those next week. Write them down. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some of the implications of this. What does it mean? You know, can God be equal with, with Jesus? Can the Father and, and Son be equal if, they're, if one is in submission to another? Uh, and so we'll talk about some of those things. And some of the um, some of the applications to complementarianism as it, as it relates to uh, headship and submission within the home and within the church as well. So we'll talk about those things next week. It'll be fun uh, and controversial, but you'll you'll have fun with that.